so what happened is there there really was no national uh, Cosa Nostra mob, organized crime, whatever you want to call it. There were no syndicates outside of the East Coast until Prohibition came along. And when the government took away people's booze, even in the middle of a depression, think about that. You have no job. Uh, you have can't put food on the table. People can't even have fun. And the government took all that away, and the mob said, hey, we can supply that. There's our business model. And they went fast coast to coast. And one of the people that was the biggest in that whole network of bootlegging was George Remus in Cincinnati. He was not only the bootleg king, he was the bootleg king of America. The intriguing part for me about um, having getting to have a conversation with you today is if you're from, I'm from Cincinnati, well, I'm a northern Kentucky guy, grew up in Boone County, it was a one-stop white town, so I'm 43 now, mm-hmm. born in 1979, it was a one-stop white town, I'm a public um, education misfit, mm-hmm. um, and traveled a little bit, had some unique corporate America jobs, but found myself back here, and 18 years ago, got into real estate. But every time that I have a conversation with someone about Cincinnati, and even though Northern Kentucky is my heart, you just can't talk about Northern Kentucky with someone out of town without saying it's Cincinnati yeah. white, right? Even right. though it's inside the loop, it's, it's 25% of the marketplace. We're the south side. But there's something special about this area. Mm-hmm. And it's, I find it hard for me to articulate because when I start talking about it, there's so many special things. And then I ask myself, am I just being a homer? Do people in Charlotte feel that way about Charlotte? Mm -hmm. Do people in Dallas feel that way about Dallas? Do people in Tucson feel that way about Tucson? I'm assuming somewhat. Yeah. However, It varies. Right? It does. I'm assuming. I've traveled a lot. Probably not as much as you. But I've traveled a lot. And I'm not the traditional tied-down family guy that – I go see my mom as much as I should. She's an amazing lady. Spend time with my brothers and sisters. But this area just seems special. It's such a mixture of all these cultures. So, to you, Cincinnati has to be special to you. It is. Right? It is. You know, uh, people in the West have a really good pride of place. So, when I lived in Tucson, I moved to Tucson from Michigan and and lived in Tucson for about 11 years. They have a, a great sense of pride in being from the West the style of life, the cultural mix, the, the, the whole Western attitude is, is very different. And then when I moved back to the Midwest in Cincinnati, I likened it to the comparison between tumbleweeds and oak trees. Cincinnati is family. Cincinnati is deep-rooted family like oaks. Out West, uh, if you get into a group of 10 people and you say, who's from Tucson, about three will be born and raised there. The rest are transplants from Ohio, Iowa, Michigan, all over the country. In Cincinnati, take that same uh, experiment, and it's the total flip. Only three or four people will be from somewhere else. That's why in Cincinnati, people always say, where'd you go to high school? You know, that's where they they identify. Is that the reason? I've always wondered, like, why? Why is it I went to Oak Hills, I went to Elder, I went to Anderson. I was like, what, what is that in us? It's, a, it's an immediate brand. <laughs> they know exactly. Are you west side, east side, it's, northeast side? It's fascinating. Yeah. Did you go to Loveland? Are you, uh, you know, went from the little suburban areas or did you downtown? Or, you know. And then we get judged, though. Oh, yeah. Well, they judge us you and put us in our little pack, pack yeah, right? Absolutely. So have you experienced any other metropolitan area in this country that's that way? When you say where you went to school. No, n- absolutely not. And that would be the last question you'd ever be asked in Tucson or in Phoenix or in Texas. Because people in the West, they're used to having people come in from other places. And, and the cool part about that, which is also very different from the Midwest and Cincinnati, is that people expect you to come and do your thing and they get out of the way and they don't look at you like, oh, is he a threat to me or anything? They're like, let's see if he falls on his face or if he's going to live up to what we hope for. Yeah. And it's kind of wide open and laid back, kind of cool standoff, but, but friends. Uh, Cincinnati, on the other hand, is kind of a tighter, more tribal. 
and uh, we're on this side, we're on that side. If you're part of this family, I used to joke when I was here for 10 years that I was hoping to someday get my green card to be, <laughs> you know, a temporary did, resident. Did you at ever least. get it? Uh, no, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you spent a lot of time here because. Um, so, did you start in the news columnist editor business? Did you start in Tucson? Because uh, Tucson citizen. Yes. Right. Uh, well, I was a, the editorial page editor and columnist in Tucson. Before that, I worked for uh, weeklies in Michigan, uh, a chain of weeklies. And then I worked, worked in briefly for a daily in Casa Grande, Arizona, which was I was the city editor. So I've done the news side. I've done the opinion side. I've done all the sides of the newspaper. I was I mean, at the weeklies, you are the sports editor, the uh, living editor, the dead editor. Everything. <laughs> Everything. You're the obituary we, guy. We is that where everyone starts? It, it is. The- <laughs> it's a good place to start. Why? Because then you really learn the business top to bottom. I mean, I my first newspaper, I even sold ads. Uh, and I had to collect from people who were paying their bills on subscriptions. It How hard was, was that? Crazy. That was really tough. I, I couldn't wait to get out of that. But when, when you're in a weekly, we used to joke that uh, if they get a call for the outdoor editor, you say, well, hold on a second while I step outdoors. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're doing you're everything, every, everything. Everything. School boards, zoning meetings. You're never at home for dinner. You're constantly working. So when you hear people, there's an old legend in the news business that guys at dailies always say, well, someday I'd like to get a job and well, my own little weekly paper and put my feet up on the desk. <laughs> Forget about it, pal. It's never going to happen. You work like a dog at a weekly. You know, I think that um, how much of who you are today mm-hmm. comes from what I call that hustle and grind. Oh, yeah. How much of that? Well, I noticed that when I eventually got to dailies and then climbed the ladder up to positions that I've always uh, wanted, which was an opinion guy, uh, writing columns because that's my love, uh, that there were a lot of people who came out of college and went to a daily who had never had that full rounded experience of really having to grind, of having to do it right, of having to look over the shoulder and make sure they're covering all the bases. And I wouldn't say, uh, I don't want to say lazy, but the work ethic was not there. Um, they, they would uh, turn in one story a week and think they're working hard. I mean, I was used to doing, filling an entire weekly paper every week. And the same thing with small dailies. I mean, you got to grind. You got to you got to churn out copy, and you got to be fast. Got to be able to work on deadline. I think that's probably the biggest thing that you learn uh, in that kind of uh, furnace of of test. How many of those people that you saw coming? How many washed out? Um, you know, the the surprising thing to me was that a lot of people wash out on the weeklies because they just can't take the pace. Mm-hmm. And even the small dailies, but in the bigger dailies, once they get on board, they kind of hang around and people move them around to find better positions for them where they don't have as much stress or pressure. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people, too, that really um, had didn't have a very good grasp of uh, writing and grammar and spelling. And, and I was kind of shocked because I thought, you know, once you get to the big daily, you're working with the elite, right? No, not necessarily. I found through my career, and it sounds like this, I'm assuming, so we've only been sitting here for seven or eight minutes, I'm assuming that who you've become, if you were sitting talking to your best friend, whoever that is, mm-hmm. could be a significant, your best friend, that's when the honesty comes out. Sure. The things we don't share with anybody else. I bet what would come through all those late nights, the early mornings, the hard work, the determination, being relentless, persistence. And then you're like, guys, if I wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't have been here. No, oh, that's very true. Right? Very true. I always, uh, I used to say, you can't always be where you want to be to get where you want to go. So um, I worked at little weeklies. I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be at the Detroit Free Press or the anything, the daily paper. But to get where I wanted to go, it turns out, um, I always, I mean, looking back now, I can see that God had a plan for me and he wanted me to be there to get to to the next step, to the next step, to the next step. And any shortcut on that would have been a different career. It would have been a different life. I might still be uh, back in East Lansing where I was uh, went to college. Who knows? Mm-hmm. It's kind of fun to think about that from time to time. But Yeah, I mean, you just wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here without it. That's right. Right? And you probably look back and you're happy that that Peter did all those things mm-hmm. so you could be sitting here. 
Yes, and uh, fortunately, um, um, you know, wives keep us humble, and my wife is great that she reminds me of that from time to time when I start trashing some people I used to work with, and she'll say, yeah, but if you hadn't done that, if you hadn't had that, that kind of experience with that boss, it wouldn't have made you a better supervisor and manager when you got to that position, which is very true. Isn't I mean, that start hard to see that in the moment? It is. It's almost impossible. It is. So what keeps us going? So when you were talking about um, all the dailies and being the outdoor sales guy when you need <laughs> yeah. to, right, the advertising yeah. guy, um, what keeps you going when so many other people are put, submitting one a week and you're submitting six, eight, ten, twelve? Why? Well, it was, uh, first of all, love of writing. I, I just love it. I, I love meeting people, telling their stories. And it is a real honor and privilege because people will, you talk about people open up when they're with their best friend or after they've had a few drinks or something. You'd be surprised how people open up if you walk up to them with a pencil or a pen and a reporter's notebook in your hand and you say, hi, I'm from the Cincinnati Inquirer and I'd like to interview about something. And I mean, people, they, they love that. As you know, doing podcasts, people love to tell their stories just like I'm doing right now. And it's something that we all have inside us. And to have somebody come up and say, not only can I tell them my story and they're going to, what, listen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they're not going to try and top me or jump in. Um, but the, also they're going to write it down and put it in the paper for other people to read. And it, take a guy like you, um, a guy that's educated, skilled, practiced, probably developed a level of mastery as you went through the years. You could actually articulate my story better than me probably. Well, uh, we hope to. <laughs> you know, uh, there's many a slip, uh, and we make mistakes. But that's we, a part of our stories. It is. It is a part of our stories. And, and people, um, when they talk to you, they, they sometimes forget how they sound. And sometimes they call you up later and go, wow, I didn't like the way I sounded at all. And you're kind of like, oh. But most of the time, yes. Um, I was gratified to be able to tell stories for people that every now and then I still run into people in Cincinnati who will come up to me and say, Oh my gosh, you wrote a column about me in 1994 or something, or and I remember this column that was so great. Thank you so much for doing that. Or you wrote a column about my dad and his service in the military, and it meant so much to him. That's really cool stuff. We used to call that the refrigerator award when somebody clipped your column and put it on the refrigerator. That was better than any prizes, believe me. It's um, do you remember the first time you walked into someone's home? Did you ever see that? Um, to see my own column. Did you see it? Mag <laughs> magnet on a fridge. Did you ever see that? I did see it once or twice, but the funniest one was when people would send me, they would clip my column and send it to me in the mail at the, <laughs> right at the top. Have you read this? Oh, shit. Oh. <laughs> no, I just wrote it. <laughs> um, the insinuation was, we don't like it. <laughs> Am I assuming that right? Oh, no, it's usually Was it very good? Yeah, very oh, positive. Oh, really? Okay. Like, oh, you'll enjoy this. Have you read it? Okay. Go, well, that's my byline on the top. So, yeah, I guess I, I read I it. I guess I'm caught up in the Twitter world now where nothing good gets said, right? Oh, isn't that a shame? It is a shame. It isn't that a shame. I, I just, social media is such a um, toxic place. Why uh, is that? Well, you know, that's kind of a good question. We noticed it at the Inquirer. Okay, when I was opinion editor and we ran letters to the editor, we verified every letter. In fact, we called people up to say, uh, Mark, did you write this letter? Because every now and then somebody would pull a prank and they'd sign your name to a letter saying something horrible about somebody or just saying something totally stupid just to embarrass you. And so we always checked them out. And then as the email came along and we started publishing letters without any um, attribution or verification, they became more and more nasty because people felt like they could just get away with it because they can. And that was the mix of social media that it really turned things toxic. When people could say whatever they want and go up online and post comments on a news story or a column, and instead of calling you up or asking you questions, why did you say this or why did you say that? They would just write something completely irresponsible and accuse you of um, uh, plagiarism or lying or dishonesty or it, it was so irresponsible. I just I really hated that side of the business when that began. Do we need to talk about the psychology of humans? Oh boy, 
you know. Because I, cause what I try to be is, everybody I'm around, I'm a really, I think people call me a passionate guy. Mm-hmm. About whatever I do, I'm just going all in. I see that. Right? And so, um, I think about, so I think I'm optimistic. Yeah. I would share that about myself. If someone say, hey, are you pessimistic? I'm like, well, I'm optimistic. But I can have some pessimistic conversations. So that's the question about society. Are humans both? Are we more one or the other? Because behind the keyboard, as we call it, right, and you're anonymous, it seems that pessimism comes out more. Mm-hmm. Criticism. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And then when Finding you're- flaws. Yes. When you're face-to-face with <clears throat> someone, you're not going to tell them maybe truly what you think about them inside. Oh, you're gonna so be, true. You're going to be overly nice. You're going to be a people pleaser. So are we humans more optimistic or pessimistic? You know, um, there is definitely a streak in us that um, wants to build ourselves up by tearing other people down or criticizing things and making ourselves sound more intelligent and able than we are. Um, However, I can tell you this, that a column can entirely change based on whether it was whether you met the person or not. If I'm writing about you on social media, I won't write the same way if I know you, I hope. Because you may know me and hold me accountable for it. Not only that, but you see me, you see the humanity in me. Yep. You see me as a person, not just a name or a celebrity or a, a somebody to attack because I'm in a bad mood. Um, and it, it just became such a game of social media where we actually had people on social media or email and, and uh, comments online on our newspaper uh, that were sort of um, virtual stalkers. And you know who they are. We call them trolls, yep. we call them stalkers, whatever. But they would follow one person, and I had a, a two or three of these people who would do nothing but get up every day and look at whatever I wrote and find ways that they could just tear me down. You know what's, unfo- you know what's unfortunate, what I found about that is, see, I think this we can learn from this the same way you learn from those bad bosses. Mm-hmm. And I am at a place now where, I guess it's with maturity, it's through evolution of life, where you become less arrogant, Maybe more confident, because I think confident goes with some form of humility a little bit. Yes. You're so okay with who you are. There's the key word, humility. Right? And so it's just saying, hey, maybe I'm as good as you and you're as good as me, but I'm not better. And I just don't want to think of it that way. Mm -hmm. But I think this stretches into this piece about those people who wake up, they're miserable. Yes. And they want to make you as miserable as they are. And it's terrible because I think I'm starting to have empathy for them. Yeah. Right? And or maybe sympathy. I can't connect with that. So maybe I'm having sympathy. Like, man, I am so happy mm-hmm. that I'm not that. Yes. Right. I'm not gonna look at it like I used to. Like, you're a horrible person. You're terrible. It's like, thank goodness, that ain't me. Yeah. Because you start to frame it like, man, how much toxicity and negativity do you have to wake up to? And then I'm like, man, if you woke up to it, what was your previous day like? Yeah. And so um, I do think if they met you or me face to face, they wouldn't feel the same. Definitely. Uh, People just, um, and some people, remember, they get their meaning. Their lives are uh, bleak, I guess, because they get their meaning from kind of piggybacking on somebody else's work to to be the the, the jester that follows the parade, uh, making fun of everybody. And they really have no meaning in life other than being some kind of a, a... detractor yeah it sucks and so how can we so many times and i touched on human psychology a yeah bit, a bit ago, um that were some that was some of my favorite college classes i don't uh-huh. know why yeah but it was i only took a couple of them but why um why is there such a lack of self-confidence and self-esteem i feel it so i don't want to put words in your mouth but i don't know if you so to me it feels like i just meet so many people and i'm like hey you have more self-worth than you feel right now right you could accomplish way more than inside for that you believe for some reason you believe that you aren't capable what someone else is but if they've done it you are Mm -hmm. you're capable and well we get beat up yeah what is this beat up you know because we we didn't feel like this at eight usually exactly there's your key you know we start out as children kind of a blank slate we're full of confidence we believe we can do whatever we want to do we're kind of raised that way and our parents and our family is built around us if we're lucky and have good loving parents and a good loving family that pours that love and support into us and confidence and constantly tells us you know we draw some crappy picture and they we bring it home and they say this is beautiful and we get the refrigerator award <laughs> you know we've and, seen those yes. yeah, yeah yeah so um but as we go on in life if we're not prepared especially 
uh, then we start bumping into the hard edges of life and people start knocking us down and telling us we're not worthy. That these people that draw their self-worth from beating up on other people's image, that's where I think a lot of people get beaten down and they take this stuff to heart. And if they don't have a firm foundation in some other source of worth, whether it's their faith or their family or their achievements in their career, all of these things, uh, I would say the most important that I've learned is faith. But if you don't have that uh, foundation in something greater that says, hey, you are worthy, you are meant for bigger things and better things, and I love you, um, wh where do they get that? Well, they don't. And they constantly go through life miserable, as you said, mm -hmm. um, angry, bitter, uh, trying to hurt other people, to inflict the pain that they feel on others. And the, I guess the old line, uh, misery deserves company, and they're dang sure they're going to get some company. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe maybe society, and I think that's the piece of – I thought about um, conversation I wanted to have with you today. I'm like, mm -hmm. this is going to be fascinating because – there's these things. I think traditionally, what I try to be, I try to be a problem solver mm -hmm. in my life. That's what I try to be. Sure. Not that I have the answers, but I, I remain curious around a subject. But there's so many subjects that in society today that seem either unsolvable or really tough to solve. All right? And so I'm thinking around this idea of social media and around human beings and, 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 and who we are. Why do you think society... Um, because I think human beings, when we start, we 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 start out, we all start out the same. Mm -hmm. No politics, no religion, no race, no race. Yeah, none of it. We all start We're the all same. Just kids, we are. And then all of a sudden, we become molded, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's generational poverty and that thing happens, whether it's you're born into a country cult club family and lifestyle, um, it seems to me so simple how we should be. It seems so simple. Yeah. Like, just so what happened? What happened? Yeah, that's it. And so I'm thinking every day, like, man, how, are, how do we make positive impacts? How do we help those people to gain more confidence? Mm -hmm. And I always look back. We all have bad things and good things happen, but as society and social media, so the social media piece, the question, because I never want questions, but there's a question. I'm like, I'm going to ask Peter this because I really want his take because you have such a, such a breadth of experience is – um. Is more information for the average human being good? Hmm. Let me frame that a little That's more. That's a deep question. Right? Because I think a guy that comes from where you are, you probably would naturally believe so. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have an educated mind, it doesn't have to mean traditional education, but just educated around thought. Is there too much information that the average human is putting into their head now? Um, yes, I would say that is true. I can argue it two ways. One is that there has never been a golden age like this where we can find out <clears throat> so many things. When I research books, to find out and, and research history and do thorough footnotes and really verify things, it's uh, clicks away if you know the way to do it. However, we also live in an era where people are trying to drink from a fire hose and we have this 24-7 constant news cycle. And it really has turned into something that's kind of a sickness, I think, which is that it's a, uh, I call it the panic factory. And you have it on the left and you have it on the right. And both of them know their demographic. They know who they want to feed. And they don't care if they're feeding you truth or lies because it doesn't matter as long as they get the clicks. They have monetized sensationalism. And they feed you these lies to get you stirred up. So when you're watching a cable news show and you see that little crawler about, across the bottom, breaking news, breaking news, that is designed to make you feel like there's something you need to do. That It's a panic inducer. It's like, what's going on now? Uh, what can I do about it? Well, there's nothing you can do about it. It's, it's meant to frustrate you and meant to make you more fearful. And so you'd never leave their little uh, their cult. Of, of disinformation in a lot of cases. I think the media has never been, in. when I speak right, written broad, the media, all levels, has never been in more danger and more trouble and more disrespected and more poisonous to our society than it is now. Yeah. So, so here's why I ask this even from my perspective, because every time I want to ask a question or have a judgment, I want to internalize it first. Sure. I try to do that more. And so I say, okay, 
if I didn't have the traditional brands of CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, CNBC, if I didn't have those, Mm -hmm. how would my wife be negative or positively impacted? Let's assume those aren't there. I'm going to be honest with you. It wouldn't really change me. Well, you know, how, see that we don't. I don't need it. Exactly. Do a simple test when you go on vacation. When I go on vacation, take a couple of weeks off, go out west, or do something and play golf. Or I don't look at any of that. I just leave it out of my life, and I I find myself sleeping better. I'm so much happier. My attitude is better. My mental health is better. Mm-hmm. And then so I, I, I've made a determined effort in the last few years to really limit the intake of that stuff. Yeah. Because if you if you let it um, start intruding in your life too much, it's going to start affecting your yeah and your I, whole outlook. I remember growing up, and there were for us in Cincinnati, it was five, nine, and twelve. I I grew up in a really conservative, traditional, um, religious upbringing. Mm-hmm. Very, very, very more than most people, and so. We were really restricted on the things we watched on TV, on the things we listened to. Like I remember. Eight track to then vinyls. Yeah. It would be Cat Stevens. Yeah. Um, it would be John Denver. Yeah. Um, those types of things. And on TV, I'm not even. I'm so embarrassed. I'm not going to talk about the shows. It would probably be <laughs> like Anna Green Gables, or it would yeah. be. Uh, but so, but I think about when the TV came on, and I remember as a kid connecting with a Peter Jennings, mm-hmm. with a Tom Brokaw, right. With those people, and as a kid growing up, I didn't identify politics with any of them. I just listened to them, and their voices were good. Obviously, they were the they were the top of the food chain. Sure. Right? But it seemed like they were just informing us yeah. with really what was happening. I'm sure that there was some opinion bent. Yeah. S- someone, right? Mm-hmm. A producer, an editor. But it didn't feel like they were trying to convince me of their way. Mm-hmm. And that seemed like a simple life. And I got to focus on being a kid, being the raised the way, hanging out with friends, developing your brain and your mind. Mm-hmm. It just seemed so simple and good. Yep. And it's just not that way anymore. And it's very unfortunate. I don't feel like how we're informed now, I don't feel like it improves me. Well, maybe it does somewhat, but I don't think it does. I don't think it does when it divides our nation the way it has. Yeah. We now have a red tribe and a blue tribe. It's unfortunate. And we each have our own sources of media. And it's like two bubbles. You ever you, like the Venn diagram? And where does it okay. come together? Where does it come together? What's the truth? Well, the media models, they don't want those to overlap because they want to control you yeah. by making you in a constant state of uh, panic. So you have to tune in to see what's next. Isn't Whatever is the yeah. story of the week. And, and you know what else they've done? <clears throat> when we were kids, m- me much longer than ago uh, than you, if things happened that were sensational uh, crimes, in some community in uh, Montana, for example, we wouldn't even hear about it. Because it doesn't matter. Now that is nationalized to make you feel unsafe in your home in Ohio. Um, it, you know, it, it's every, if it bleeds, it leads. The other thing that I've learned over the years in just watching media is that, that what, what you met, called out was the rise of television and how television is emotional. It goes back to McLuhan's uh, The Media is the Message. Television is raw emotion. It has the way to influence influence you and shape you through your emotions, not your logic, not your practicality, not through facts and figures. It, there's an old line that um, you could have congressional testimony for a week where experts would come in and stack documents a foot high, and they could bring in one woman with a tear rolling down her cheek on a TV uh, network, and that would just push all that other stuff off the table. Because it, it's all emotion. And, and people today tend to think, a lot of them, I believe, think with their emotions, not their head. And whatever they're being shaped or pushed into, this is the thing to do, that's the thing to do, or this is how you should feel about that. You should hate these people. You should like these people. This is our tribe, their tribe. Hate them, like them. Vote for them no matter what, no matter how crooked or incompetent they are. If they're in your, your tribe, that's your team. So what do we do about all this? So when I went back to him, a problem solver, that's why I think it seems so overwhelming. I'm a human, so I'm not perfect. Right. But I get up every day, and whatever I'm responsible for, I'm, I'm trying to do it well. I do my best. And a part of that is like try to be a good human. 
Yeah. I don't put a ton of pressure on myself, but just go back, just go out in the old golden rule stuff. Just treat people the way I'd want to be treated. Right. We're not perfect. We probably get upset if our coffee comes out a little bit longer. We have yeah. to be somewhere. But it's like, man, that traffic. Yeah, right. <laughs> but that, you, know, that's, you think you're a good guy until you get in traffic right? and somebody you say cuts a couple you things, off. right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to do a better job of that, even saying in program of mind, be like, they don't know me. Right. That wasn't even that wasn't an, that wasn't an intentional knock on me. Uh huh. And so I don't know what the heck we do. I guess I just have to put my head down and try to impact a few people around me. Well, you know, you know, uh, maybe it took me way too long to figure this out, but uh, simply having a positive attitude, a smile, uh, loving on people, being kind to them, even when they're acting like a jerk. I mean, if I once upon a time I used to go to somebody and hold them personally responsible for my coffee getting late. Uh, now I go to somebody and I say, I know it's not your fault, but boy, that took a long time. Is he having a rough day? Tell me about it. You know, that kind of attitude goes a long way. You'd be surprised. It doesn't well always work, but it really does work a lot to help people out, make them feel better. I mean, it goes back to what you're saying. How do we make people feel better about themselves so they're not always trying to tear other people down? How do we do it, Peter? How do we do it? By writing your books. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's cool is I, I love your your story. Um, that chili press. Those of us from Cincinnati, chili dog press. We we think that that's a what we call chili, a skyline and gold star, and all the other individuals, Price Hill Chili. But chili dog press was named after Chili the Labrador. That's right. Right. <laughs> You've done your homework. Well, we're supposed to a little bit, right? Yeah. It was a. It was kind of one of those accidental things that just kind of worked out. And uh, she was a great dog. She used to. We got her in Arizona, and she would chase coyotes. And I mean, it was just a fun dog. And um, and so we liked her. And I was starting a publishing company. And I said, "Oh, let's name it Chili Dog Press," and it ended up being a great fit for Cincinnati because, hey, this is the the chili town, right? Yeah, I think um, what I, without us knowing each other before today, what I love about you is um, there's a sense of a rebel inside of you. Oh yeah. And what I love about that is you don't just take the some of the the BS that the world gives you. No. And and when you were evaluating writing your first book, mm-hmm. like I'm a guy that I am not near I'm that guy who my grammar's not as good as should as it should be. I gotta read that email a few times. Sure. Right? And my handwriting is terrible. Well, that's like most of us. I can barely read my own handwriting right. anymore. I so, could be a doctor. Right. Yeah, hey, there you <laughs> yeah. go. That's what I'm gonna say, guys. I was supposed to be a doctor. Right. Um my significant other, she's in education. She's an administrator and she came up through the through the tears, a teacher and coach, so all that, and she just laughs. laughs because she's so spot on with everything. Right. So maybe she's the balance. But So um, you lose at Scrabble. Oh. Crushes me. I will beat her at anything else competitive, but Scrabble. Yeah, I just know not to play. What are, can we do? Two letter words today. <laughs> I got those down. Maybe we can evolve to three, like I and dog. Maybe four if it's ball. <laughs> the one you hate to hear is that's not a word. That's it. Just looked like one to me. <laughs> that's how my brain goes. Yeah. Um, but what I love is, um, even though you were in the business of being a reporter columnist in all parts of the news media the traditional news media you then evolved it makes sense hey i'm gonna write a book Mm -hmm. and i'm assuming that thought came from i have a lot to say yes but then when you looked and figured out the book publishing business yes that was a shock right so speak to that even though i could read about you and and who you are speak to what you learned about that and how long it because it went from this place i'm gonna write a book pumped and excited people want to hear about it Talk about the evolution of understanding the publishing business, and as that goes on, is it the same today? Well, my my second book, the first was a collection of columns, which was pretty straightforward. The second one was about the riots in 2001 in Cincinnati, and my take was very contrary. The rebel, as you said, I'm a contrarian. When I see a crowd of people going in uh, east, I want to go west and see what they're running from. Um, so if I'm uh, looking at this from a totally different side than the local media, I wrote the book, uh, which was interviewing police and seeing it from their point of view, what really happened, how did the government work and not anyway. Um, so it was, it was, uh, I guess you'd say countercultural, as we used to say in the seventies in the true sense of the word, it was very counter to the culture of the time. And I took that to a publisher And the publisher said, um, and this is a publisher that's not located in Cincinnati. 
And the publisher said, um, I don't think we can do this unless we make some changes. And I said, why is that? And she says, well, because this is not what really happened. And I said, now, wait a minute. I'm the editor. I'm on the ground there. I'm reporting these stories. I'm on the streets of Cincinnati. And you're telling me that you know better from another city what happened in Cincinnati than I did? Of course. We know that's not what happened because we read the newspapers. And I said, well, that's the whole point of this book is to question what was written in the rest of the media from first, for, from first person uh, point of view from the police who were there. Well, <clears throat> as you can tell, that didn't go well. Plus, I didn't like the idea that they were going to take my property and make changes that they wanted to make. That, that offended me. And then I looked at the business model, which is that uh, just as sketching it out in very broad terms, if I have a book that's priced for $20 and uh, I give it to them to publish, they give me 10% of the, the sales. So I'm making $2 a book. I thought, that's wrong. <laughs> that's my work. That's my intellectual property. Why are you taking 90%? Uh, so, um, and, and all of that they were really giving me for that was the, some kind of vague promise that they would help me market the book. Well, I knew I could do that. Uh, so, um, I came up with my own approach and I said, I'm going to build a company which kind of grew organically and, uh, help people write books so that they own their own intellectual property. They will get good advice about editing and writing and coaching, but I'm never going to say this is how it has to be or you can't publish. So they generally follow direction. They follow advice, but they don't feel like they're pressured to make fundamental changes in their, their beliefs, for example, or their, um, what they believe happened. So uh, this version is entirely different. Uh, we charge by the hour. Uh, we give people basically a chance to own their own property, publish their book. We direct them to printers. We get them all the background stuff they need, ISBN number, copyright, everything else. We have a designer who designs their book and their cover. We have um, editors, that's me, and others that I hire sometimes from uh, freelancers. And uh, whatever is needed to build that book. And when they're finished, they pay the front-end costs back on an hourly basis. And once they pay that back, they keep everything. So basically, we flipped the model. Now they get the 90%, and we just take the 10, which I, I think is the revolution in publishing. That's why independent publishers are popping up all over the place. What would it cost? Now, everyone, but take one of these books. I won't. So take <clears throat> yours. We'll talk about some of them. <clears throat> so, so you brought us one today. Yes. Um, so we'll talk about some of them, but this one's the Forbidden Fruit. Right. So it's a softback. Mm -hmm. um, what would this book, this is dense, there's a lot of stuff in here. Yes. Like, I love that. Lots of good pictures, too. Yeah, this is good. So, how much, if I weren't as educated or refined as a writer as you are, mm -hmm. how much would this book cost me to write? If I had the content and if just- you wrote the book. If, if I wrote the book. You give me the manuscript yep. for the editing to make it conform to style. There's the wild card because it depends on how much editing is needed. Uh, obviously With me a lot. Work, Let's just say a lot. Okay, so we're working hourly. Yep. So I seldom publish books that cost people more than about five thousand. Okay. So maybe it's ten All grand in. for a guy like Mark. All in. Okay. And that's except for your printing. Now yep. when you get that the whole thing is finished, the cover is designed, the interior is designed. All of the editing is done. You have a complete manuscript ready to go to a printer. Then we hook you up with a printer, and usually we can find you printing for about five dollars a book or less. Okay. Depends so, on the volume. You're looking at a twenty dollar book. Okay. So your your front end cost is five thousand plus five dollars a book. Mm -hmm. Now look at your your business model when you're selling them for twenty. Yep, that's awesome. Isn't that great? That's really good. What's it cost? I won't put the name out here on this, but what's it cost for a hardback versus a soft? We generally don't do hardbacks. We do a few okay. uh, because people just want the hardback, but it, it ruins your business model as a writer to sell that because now you've gone from five dollars a book printing to up to ten dollars. Okay. Now. It takes you so much longer to recover your front-end costs. And I tell people, look, for your first book especially, yeah. you're going to have a hard time selling more than a few thousand. So you want to recover your front-end cost and and look at the long game, mm -hmm. but don't buy something that's going to make it really expensive for people to buy. Because then you got to go out and charge them instead of 20 you got to charge them 25 30 $35 a book. Then you're going up against the market when you aren't a brand yet, right? Yes. Right, when they aren't knowing, like, hey, we're... Go so what I said about Charlie Rose in the beginning, he's kind of my north star of a conversationalist. And I always tuned into Charlie Rose on the PBS stations, regardless of who he was interviewing. And it was very rare I would turn it off. Uh -huh. Very rare. Yeah. And so 
a guy like me is not Charlie Rose of books yet. I'm not an author that people are because there's authors like, wow, I'm just going to read it. Until you become that, don't want to make the big investment. Well, uh, you know, you'd be surprised. People write books for all kinds of reasons. It's yeah. something that they've always wanted. They've always dreamed of having a book on their shelf with their name on it. And a lot of people just have a great story to tell. Yeah. I mean, we do inspirational books. We do devotionals. We do. You've looked at the website. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, books about sports, books about business, how to, helping people in business, inspirational stories of people that started out with nothing and made it to become uh, millionaires in uh, apartment rentals. Um, and really started broken homeless. So, it, you know, these stories, people do have great stories to tell. <clears throat> and our job is my job, because really Chili Dog Press is mostly me, but um, my job is to help them get their story told in a way that will be approachable and readable to the average reader, and it will look as professional as any book in the bookstore that you can see. I'm excited for, as this continues to build, and regardless of the brand of our podcast, the reason why I know so many of us have a story, we really all have a story to tell. Yes. And it, all, every one of them could be a book. I think the other day, it's either 71 or 79% of millionaires are all self-made. Wow. That's an impress- impressive. Right? Didn't start out with anything. So when you said that, I'm like, that's true. Yeah. Se- it's it's somewhere in, in the se- 71 or 79. Didn't start it. They, they made every dollar themselves. Wow. They weren't given a thing. And so there's so that's why there's so many underlying positive things about the country. I won't go cultural right now, yeah. but it seems like there's so many negative things out there. I remember um, when I used to think, what was that show on the li- lifestyles of the rich and famous? Yeah, yeah. Remember, I don't know how you Regis felt. Regis Philbin or somebody. No, like no that, that was um, what was the guy's name? He was English. Dave, what was his name? You guys remember his name? So, um, but I remember the guy's voice. But I remember watching that as a kid, and I looked up to those people. <laughs> Sure. I remember saying, wow, look what they've accomplished in life. Society isn't doing a good job of that anymore. No. In fact, if anything, it seems like a lot of people, especially who have too much access to the media, are trying to tear it down. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Tear down the American dream. Tear down. Um, they, they. It's really kind of. Um, it's, it's unfortunate. We're in a bad situation. Yeah. And so I don't know what we do with it, but I think the story of the local person who cr- who came up through an economy who then has five chili shops or yeah. has four ice cream shops. They become a millionaire, but you know what? Like they're they're giving us something good about our society, a place we like to go. And if we're going to go there and spend money versus somewhere else, let them make it. Yeah. Let them go build a good life because exactly. they've given us something in the market. Yeah. that we appreciate. I just there's just nothing bad about that. Well, it's not a zero sum game. It's I mean, not. your success does not take anything away from me. In fact, it helps me because first it offers a model, it creates business, it creates jobs, it creates a better quality of living and standard of living for all of us. It's awesome. So we want success. We don't want to tear people down because they're successful or or tell them you didn't build that because uh, government it's only possible with government. No. It, that's terrible. Yeah, so I think about I'm not a guy that has rides on private jets or don't have one. Maybe one day, but I don't. <laughs> but, you know, every time one lands at Lunkin Field, there's somebody that's cleaning it. Yep. There's someone that's putting fuel in it. Yeah. There's someone down the line that refined the fuel. Those were good jobs of the backbone of this country. And the deal that was made in New York or Hong Kong or wherever is going to ensure jobs and create new products and create new markets and – yeah, and raise the level of our whole region, and they're gonna then they're gonna go to Kenwood Town Center, and if you have more money, and and in Cincinnati, if you live in Montgomery or Indian Hill or Madeira or one of those places, and your place to shop is Kenwood, and you go to Pottery Barn, and you meet a person that does home design, and they come out to your home, and they spend seventy thousand dollars on furniture, that improves so many people's lines, lives down the line. Sure. Gosh, I just hate, I hate that we've disconnected from that, and I yeah. think it's this it's this media thing. It's the, all this information that all this information being fed into us about who's a millionaire, who's a billionaire. It's irrelevant to my life. Well, in, in the media thing, and I'll get on my soapbox here for just a minute. But as I was in my career, you called back to the Peter Jennings, the Walter Cronkite era mm-hmm. when we had three networks. The standard was the gold standard for media was objectivity, impartiality, tell both sides, be fair. Um, don't don't just tell one side of the story or push an agenda. You could get fired for that. If you were a, a cub reporter and you brought stories in that were pushing your opinion, 
it, people would tell you, uh, I'm sorry, this is opinion. You can't, I'm, I'm going to red pencil all of that out of there. Go back and rewrite it as a news story. We have an opinion section over here and we have a news section over here and there's a Berlin Wall between the two. Well, throughout my career, I gradually be, I saw that wall be torn down. And what we see today is people, everybody in the news business has an opinion and they're all pushing their opinion. And they're disguising it as news and they're pushing agendas. And it's gotten to the point where it's become that the media, the, what I call the, the big media, um, networks, Washington Post, New York Times, et cetera, have totally lost credibility. It's almost a, um, a suicidal um, direction they're taking, which is to become so partisan that nobody has respect for them, nobody believes what they report. And then where are we as a country if we can't have common facts and things in common that we at least believe together? Because if that Venn diagram doesn't touch, well, you're in one bubble over here, I'm in another bubble over here, and the first thing that happens when those bubbles collide or touch is they explode. You know what's unfortunate about that? I'm sitting here listening with this problem-solving brain, and I'm like, okay, if Peter and Mark, two different generations, two different spectrums of business and how we built careers, who care about others, who are trying to develop mastery in my career, you've developed mastery, but you continue to evolve, if we don't have the answer, what do we have? What do we have? It's um, I see a dark future ahead for the media, especially. And what and the, the founders knew the media was a critical piece of the foundation of this country. It's called the Fourth Estate. It was built to hold people accountable. And to hold people accountable, you have to be trusted, to be impartial. I mean, what would you think if your courts were full of judges who um, – who paraded around carrying party labels and uh, and let the well maybe we're we're already that's, there. That's, uh, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, w where they let one party go and the other one goes to prison. I mean, in some cases we're there, but it's the breakdown of institutions. See, that's it. And so what I think about every day, I'm like, okay, so I grew I grew up very poor. When you're talking about monetary, there was obviously something about the the upbringing that benefited me. So there's something about that that wasn't poor, but the financial piece, very poor. Yes. Food stamps in a period and all that. But I don't look back on that as negative. Right. I look back on, wow, what a learning experience. Probably adversity and all that, but it taught me so many things. But I didn't, I then, I didn't get caught up on judging people who were different than me. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I wasn't raised that way. Well, you know, I think that probably part of that is that you come from a background where you understand what it's like to be there. Yeah. And if you don't, it's so easy to look at the waiter or the mechanic or the guy who mows your lawn or the guy who does uh, manual labor in the, in the blue collar world, as we used to call it, as being less than you, of being less than human, of treating them like something on your shoe. And if you come from that background, and I do too, I mean, I worked all these jobs that were like manual labor and you name it, I would do it for hourly wages. And when you're rubbing elbows with those people, you, first of all, you find out that a lot of them are a lot smarter than most people think. They have great life experience. They're hardworking. They're good people for the most part. And they deserve a lot of our respect. But there's so many people today that have been college educated, never had to really do real hard work in their lives, who look down on that and, and really um, belittle that. Yeah, this, what sucks about this is everything we're talking about, judges, politicians, um, people in the media, the thing, the shared experience, we're all freaking humans. Yes. And we're the ones that are directing these things. Every time I hear about the government, I'm like, hey, can y'all hit the brakes? Because we're collectively the government. Mm-hmm. At least that's how this thing. theory. That's how it's supposed to be set up. And I'm like, man, what is wrong with us mm -hmm. that we can't get back to this thing that I'm okay with some selfishness. I think there's this divide that I always try to figure out, like, where's the commonality and the division between selfishness and selflessness? Where is that for me? Because I think it's okay to have some of both. But where is it? How how much? Where's the, where's the, the you know, the graph? Yeah. And... There's way too much selfishness. Yes. Way too much. Not enough humility. There's not. Right? I mean, like, as the old saying goes, uh, don't think less of yourself, but think of yourself less. 
Man, I tell you what, I think back when I, I, I go back to this day of the speech with JFK. I don't know when in the 60s that was, right? Yeah. What you could do for the country, right? Yep. And so I think Ask about that. Not. Yes. And I'm like, man, if we led with that thing, I don't care. Politics, I don't know if I would like his politics today. I don't know, but I don't care. I just know that statement at that microphone yeah. in 1960, whatever it was. Yeah. It's like, man, that is the principle of what would fix all of this. Yeah. Every piece of it. What the hell has happened to us that we allow ourselves to get caught up in it every day? I don't know. And so I know it's possible to pull ourselves out because I'm not. There's people way more highly educated than me. Master's degree, PhDs, way more people. But it's about a thought of like you get up every day and, hey, just let me try to do the best I can. Let me just try to treat people as well as I can. Let me just go out and make a little positive impact in the world, but let me just focus on working on me more. Mm-hmm. Not Peter. Yeah. Not Dave. Not Jack. Let me just work on me. And if I work on the me more than like focusing on somebody working on, if I do more of that every day, it's probably going to be okay. Yes. Like it seems so simple to me, and that's why these big ideas and all this stuff from you know media and social media throwing it's like guys, that stuff is irrelevant. I'm not saying it doesn't matter in Montana. I'm not saying sure. that. It's not that I don't care. But it, it has no implication on my life here and what I'm doing today. Boy, if we could just remember how much of the things we worry about and concern ourselves about that we really have absolutely no influence over, they don't have direct impact on our lives, and we have no way of changing them, and we waste all that mental and emotional and spiritual energy obsessing over things that, that really are so trivial and meaningless but there again, I, I go back to the media model, which yeah. is to create this bubble yeah. where you're trapped in that um, that gas of uh, maybe, meaningless. You know, I think maybe this new podcasting world can matter I, and because the huge podcasts are circumventing that mm-hmm. media model. Good. I don't, right, I don't care. Like There's Joe Rogan's out there, right? <laughs> so Joe Rogan is one of the guys. He has millions and millions of followers. It doesn't matter if you like the guy or not. But if you've ever listened to the podcast, if you have or if you haven't, the the conversations he has. Very good. Very good. Yeah. And people might look at that guy as a meathead. He's always in the gym. He he is the um, announcer for UFC. That guy's yeah. smart. He is. Very smart. Right. And so he is. he sat across from people in 1,900 podcasts. Wow. 1,900 they've had. And so you listen to those people. It will give you perspective of the world that – wouldn't be reported that exactly. wouldn't be given to us in the news media so maybe well, we're circumventing it well you know what needs to be done and we were talking about this uh with some friends the other night is that there used to be a time when even in my more recent memory when i was working at the Enquirer and we did a tv show on channel nine called hot seat and it was a collection of um uh there was a lawyer there was a woman who worked for city beat kathy y wilson who was um she just passed away recently, which is uh, very sad to hear that. She was a good friend. And Kathy Wilson and I couldn't have been farther apart politically, but I invited her to be on that show so that we could exchange ideas, so that we could give a back and forth and show people where we're coming from and try and support our arguments. And it was really healthy. We would bring on all kinds of guests we had on uh, – uh, police officers, the leader of the FOP. We had Mike Brown on one time. We had all kinds of people on the show. And it was just a really good give and take. Well, I don't see any of that happening anymore. It's all people shouting over each other. They have a group over here that's on Fox. They have a group over here that's on CNN or MSNBC, and they all agree. And they generally all agree. And there's not enough um, give and take where people actually listen and defend their point of view Man, and that's the stuff I appreciate. I think we have a shot through podcasting to do that. I think we do. because And to talk about the subjects, I wish we would talk about all the controversial subjects in a professional, conversational manner. And then you could figure out your point of view. Right. Right. See, that's what I think. Without you were being getting, labeled yes. or being uh, called a name. Yes. Or like, here's what I'm going to Canceled. I'm gonna, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wish that we could talk about I'm going to find a way around not saying what's I wish we could talk about like a subject like World War II, mm-hmm. and the good and the bad, the bad dictators, the good people on the side of Western democracies, I wish people could talk about a bad person or two, whether it was Italy, whether it was Germany, whoever sure. it was, 
and and even in Russia and you know even though we partnered with him at the end yeah. I wish we could have a conversation about even if it's 95% bad I just wish we could break everything down about those people yeah what happened in their life mm-hmm. what happened when they were a kid where did it go wrong where did it deviate I just wish there could be conversations around it all but and, it's so it's so dangerous. Now. Yeah, it is, isn't it? They'll it's, cancel you in a half a second. It's crazy what's happened. It's unfortunate, but I think, but that's where the podcasting thing. But I guess even on iTunes and Spotify and YouTube, where this goes, you do say the wrong thing and have the right guest on or the wrong guest on. And they're going to shut you down. They'll cancel you. Yeah. So maybe, maybe censorship is a real thing. Isn't that wild? It is. I never thought I'd see the day when people in the media, yeah, in newspapers, would actually. Uh, speak up in favor of censoring other points of view. And that same group used to be the defenders yes, of free absolutely. speech. Absolutely. Well, because that's the whole business model for the press. It's the First Amendment. Without the First Amendment, there would be no free press. And yet you have people in media, in on TV, on talk shows, which it's a little bit more understandable because a lot of them are not really under uh, trained in journalism or understanding of the First Amendment. But in newspapers? Come on. It's ridiculous. Uh, I mean, I was... I was once told by one of our editors that we should we should stop running a conservative columnist that was very popular, and I said, "Why is that?" You, well, because he's wrong. <laughs> and I said, "Well, you think he's wrong? It's an opinion. Yeah. If you don't like it, write a letter write, to write, the editor. Yeah, write an op-ed or something. Right. Yeah. Like tell us why you think it. Put, let's put them side by side. Yeah. You don't just lift him out of the paper and cancel him because you think he's wrong. Yeah. I was I was appalled. Yeah. So some stuff started changing. Oh. So yeah. what I love is. So I want to talk about some of your books. Okay. Um, I bet this is a big selling season. It is. So let's try to sell some books. Well, about 60% of all books are sold during the Christmas shopping season. Okay. So, yes, this is the peak time. I love, I think the things that you wrote some books around here, Mm -hmm. oh, it's so fascinating. We love to talk about these things. Oh, really? I do. I wish the world knew that Las Vegas was not the first Las Vegas. No. What was? (laughs) Newport. Yeah, Newport what? Newport was Vegas before Vegas was cool. Let's talk about something. Newport, Kentucky. Yes. Okay. Newport, Kentucky. So so share some of these things with us because I don't know why we like the mob lifestyle. I don't know why we I don't know why, but we love it. It is. It's it's romantic. You know, it's a, it's been romanticized and and there's a, a certain um cachet or attraction for the whole thing of crime, but th- the way they lived, the the things they did, the the whole secrecy, the omerta, the, 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 what we called the silent syndicate was the Cleveland mob. So uh, the, the short story, and I'll try and condense this and jump in with questions whenever you want. But so let's the first question be this when you talk about it. What book? Is it The Forbidden Fruit? Is that really so? It's sitting here. It's The city, Sin City's Underworld and The Supper Club Inferno, which we can talk about Beverly Hills and all that. Correct. But is a lot of it in this book, The Forbidden Fruit? It is. This is where the story starts. And then I pick it up in my second book, Not in Our Town, which takes the story. This one runs from 1930s to 1977 at the Supper Club fire. The the next one picks it up in the 50s on the Cincinnati side of the river and says, okay, what was going on with the mob there? And that takes you up to the 1990s. Okay, so I interrupted you. You were talking about the silent syndicate, Cleveland, and the evolution here. And So what happened is there there really was no national uh, Cosa Nostra mob, organized crime, whatever you want to call it. There were no syndicates outside of the East Coast until Prohibition came along. And when the government took away people's booze, even in the middle of a depression, think about that. You have no job, uh, you have can't put food on the table, people can't even have fun. And the government took all that away and the mob said, hey, we can supply that. There's our business model. And they went fast, coast to coast. And one of the people that was the biggest in that whole network of bootlegging was George Remus in Cincinnati. He was not only the bootleg king, he was the bootleg king of America. He sold more bootleg liquor than anybody in the we whole have, country. We have a Remus bottle of bourbon over here. All right. I think we do. So anyway, yeah. So and I know that name. Do you think people nationally know that name? I don't think they do. A little bit. Okay. Um, if people watched a show that was called Boardwalk Empire, there was a character in there, George Remus. And uh, so, it, but nationally, no, the Midwest is overlooked because everybody is, um, the, uh, is East Coast centric and West Coast centric. So we hear a ton about the East Coast mob with the Godfather movies and all that. But I'll tell you, those East Coast crime families were very much a presence in Newport, too. So George Remus set up his uh, crime empire in Newport, and when he went to prison, his gang took over and opened uh, gambling clubs. So it's a, a very clear progression for what the mob did. They start out with bootleg liquor, 
And then when prohibition is repealed, they immediately move into gambling because now you've got casinos, which now you serve the liquor, you got the gambling, and then gambling leads to prostitution. So they've got gambling, prostitution, there's the next thing. And, and gradually, this builds this empire in Newport that was incredible. So in 1970, around the late 60s, the FBI said that Newport, Kentucky, was handled, had a bigger handle, which is the take, on all its rackets than Las Vegas. And the, the take in Las Vegas in those years was $3 billion. So what they're saying is that Newport had a take on illegal rackets that was bigger than the combined tax revenue of Ohio and Kentucky together. It's incredible, isn't it? I mean, they were the national capital of layoff betting. They had phone banks all over the place in basements. Uh, they had people taking bets. They had a guy named the Wizard of Odds who was so good at, uh, at calculating odds that the NFL hired him to flag crooked games. So Out all Newport, this, Kentucky. Yeah, all this is happening in Newport. There are gambling clubs everywhere. There were <clears throat> casinos, carpet joints were the nice ones, bust out joints were the tacky ones where you uh, you left busted. That's why they called it that. Mm-hmm. One way or another. Mm-hmm. So that's 1970. Yeah, so this is all leading up uh, at in the 1960s um, a reporter came up from uh, Louisville and he counted 300 prostitutes in 1 mile on Monmouth Street. Yeah. So that's how wild it was. It was so busy. They had day streets and night streets for the brothels, for all the traffic that was coming in. And this went on uh, all the way through the 60s up until all the way through the 50s, up until about 1960, when uh, Jack Kennedy got elected, appointed his new his brother as the new attorney general. And there was this amazing scandal in Newport where Uh, A guy named George Ratterman ran for sheriff on the cleanup ticket. And the mob filled him full of uh, chloral hydrate knockout drops and framed him in bed with a a dancer. (laughs) We could put dancer in air quotes. Uh, Her name was April Flowers. What do you know? Yeah. (laughs) Her real name was Juanita Hodges. But (laughs) April Flowers was her stage name. And so they uh, haul the sheriff. They haul him out of bed with this uh, hooker dancer and his career as sheriff is ended, right? Well, not quite. He had his blood tested. It showed the chloral hydrate. The whole thing blew up in headlines that went around the world. Even in Tokyo, they were writing about this story. And uh, George Raderman basically won the, the office of sheriff um, after the mob was cleaned out by Bobby Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy saw what happened to George Raderman and said, uh, I'm sending my guys. And he gave him a blank check to come down to Newport. And that's where he initiated his war on the mob. Now, this is where the whole thing took a really interesting detour because research on books is like going down a door or hallway of doors. And each door you open leads to another hallway of doors. And suddenly this hallway opens up and it's the whole Kennedy assassination. So I made a request through FOIA uh, for the Freedom of Information Act. And I, I went to the FBI vault and plugged in keywords, and I hit the combination right. And they sent me three CDs of illegal wiretaps and information about the mob. And in these illegal wiretaps that were done by Bobby Kennedy, they were tapping into a, um, an, a room at the uh, Desert Inn, which was run by one of the big mobsters. In Vegas. In Vegas. Yeah. And they're discussing killing the Kennedys. And that led to other places. But anyway, circle back to Newport. Bobby Kennedy declares war on the mob in Newport, Kentucky. A few few years later, his brother is killed. Um, a 1979 investigation totally debunked the um, the uh, Warren Commission Warren Commission, and proved almost beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was the mob who killed Jack Kennedy. And that they're they're thinking on that in those tapes that I had that I still have. Um, the transcripts say that they're saying that um, they wanted to kill Bobby. And somebody pointed out, no, if you kill Bobby, Jack will come at us with everything he's got. We go after Jack. And uh, so you have all of these connections in our local history that were just astounding to me. I'd, I had no idea how big the mob was, that it was run by the Cleveland Syndicate, that they also had pieces of the action that were given off to the New York families, to Chicago, to keep the peace. It was big, big, big time. But after the Ratterman blow up, um, after Bobby Kennedy cleaned him out, 
uh, the big mobsters all went to Las Vegas. In fact, there were so many people leaving Newport for Las Vegas at that time, the airlines, the flights to Vegas were nicknamed Syndicate Airlines. Wow. And uh, it was just an incredible time. Wow. So on that JFK thing, that's fascinating to everyone. Um, who was the guy in New Orleans? Who was the mob connected guy? Marcello. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carlos Marcello. Yep. He and uh, Santo Traficante in, in Tampa mm -hmm. and Sam Giancana in, in Chicago. Chicago. They, those were the three. And they were also deeply involved with Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters Pension Fund. And Hoffa was absolutely desperate to kill Kennedy. He hated the guy. Kennedy was prosecuting him and made his life miserable, put him in prison. And, and Hoffa swore he would kill Kennedy. And when Kennedy, when, when Jack was killed, he wanted to kill Bobby. But when Jack was killed, he danced on a table, according to the stories. So why, um, what happened with Bobby? That's a curious thing, too. Um, the more you look into that, the more the official version really doesn't stand up. Um, I didn't. I was always pretty much agnostic on these things. I'd read some books about the Kennedys, and I kind of uh, thought there was a lot of questions about Jack Kennedy. You know, even today, seventy percent of the people do not believe Oswald was a lone gunman in America. You can conduct that poll any time, and even today, uh, the CIA and the White House and the FBI are still blocking release of the Kennedy Papers. Aren't they supposed to be out in December now or something? Oh, Isn't that God. supposed to happen? Oh, my gosh. And they were supposed to be out about 20 years ago. So here's what's, here's my question about that. I'm sure you have an opinion because you know way more than I have. I just You tell I have a little bit of understanding about some of it, but not what you do. Why wouldn't – why is it not okay for us to know? Oh, well, that's a good question. Why is it not okay? You know, this is the kind of thing, when you learn this stuff, it really destroys any confidence in our government, such as institutions like the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover was completely compromised by the mob. Yep. He had a um, homosexual lifestyle with his chief assistant, and those two carried on and dressed up, put on dresses. This is back in the days when this was considered blackmailable. Yep. Today, probably not so much. Nope. I mean, things yep. have changed Might a lot. Might be championed now. Yeah. Yep. But in those days, um, and the FBI had pictures. Yep. They had complete control over him. He liked to go to the racetracks and bet the ponies, and he always did so with mob advice in the company of mobsters at the track. So, so Hoover, much so that he didn't even acknowledge the mob, right? No, he pretended there was no such thing until Bobby Kennedy forced him to admit there was such a thing as the mob. On that commission. Yes. Yeah. And then he directly interfered with the Warren Commission and covered up evidence and, and basically uh, trash can memos that pointed to connections between Lee Harvey Oswald and Carlos Marcello. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just shameful. It, and it's amazing that this chapter in our history has been so completely uh, fogged over that people today really have no idea what happened. You know, I'd love to, I mean, we love conspiracies, and yes. th but um, it'd just be good just to know. Yeah. Let's just know and put it to bed. Yeah, why right? not? Why not? Yes. Why is it that the CIA and the White House, in this latest uh, effort to release these papers, once again withheld them, and you know what their excuse was? National security. What possible national security issues could we have? They're dead. Everyone's dead. Everybody's dead. Yeah. They're gone. And the dumb shit the CIA and the FBI is doing now, it's way worse the things they're doing now compared to what they were doing back then. Yeah. So come on. I mean, we already think they're doing this stuff and they did it, so let's just let's just get through it here. Yeah. Just well, come on, just put it out. I mean, what what national security interest uh, is there is there other than protecting the tarnished reputation of both the FBI and the CIA? That's it. Yeah. So I guess we have to get it out in the public on how bad they both really are. The reasons and purposes for them are good, right? The origin, right. I guess, right? Absolutely. Just go ahead and just admit that you're just as bad as we think you are and then get to improving it. But um, it's fascinating. Well, you know, if you read history, there was a group called the Praetorian Guard in Rome, and they were the secret service of the day, the elite top Roman soldiers. And they were um, assigned to guard the emperor and protect his life. Well, they soon figured out that the, nobody was closer to the emperor, and if they didn't like an emperor, they would take his life. They would uh, basically murder him, and then they had control over who would be the next emperor. And today, you look at these agencies like the FBI and the CIA, and it's hard not to draw a direct parallel to the Praetorian Guard. Am I supposed to say that's scary? It is very scary. The secrets that they withheld from us, uh, in a way— 
I've always been somewhat, well, you have to be a somewhat of a cynic to be in the news business. Uh, you disbelieve until you can prove. Always check things out. Uh, I really uh, didn't even scratch the surface of how corrupt and un, uh, dishonest our federal institutions like the FBI and the CIA were until I got into these books. And the second one, I uncovered some amazing stories in that, too. Um, do you find it tough um, to walk into a room of whoever it may be? Usually you can't walk into any room without there being some agenda, being agenda-filled. Do you find it really tough to walk into a room and be transparent and honest. Yes, it is, because in this culture today, it's like a minefield. Uh, if you say the wrong word, if you use a word that's considered no longer usable, if you, I mean, you know, we've actually come to the point where people, and this is the, the triumph of tyranny, is to make you think before you speak, to make you think in ways that you're fearful of what you say, that if I'm honest, I may pay a price. And that is the triumph of tyranny. People in this country, at least, was founded with the, the premise that we can say, speak our minds and we all sort this out in the marketplace of ideas. And if there's counterfeit opinions, if there's ideas that are just bad, they get sorted out and we, and we return to the good ones. It, it, it's really a shame that um, we've come to this pot, that, that people have to be so careful and uh, fearful that they're going to be canceled or that's what that's what that's when i personally learn the most is when i have a thought curious Mm -hmm. right work through an idea Mm -hmm. that's the best and if we're not allowed to do that anymore how can we get the closest thing to like an idea meritocracy or something how can how can we even get there yeah okay let's take let's say um uh, communists yep uh back in the 50s they were um like lepers right Mm -hmm. And for for good reason went through Hollywood and everything. Like, yeah, wasn't yeah. Ronald Reagan like? Wasn't he a big champion against the communists? Yes, that was one of his big things. Right. Okay. So so really, um, what happened though is people could speak about it and they could have debates. Mm-hmm. So people like uh, Bill Buckley or somebody would take on uh, the the leader of the Communist Party and have a debate. What what is wrong? What is flawed about your thinking? How can I find the flaws in it and expose them for you? And you go ahead, try and do it to me because I that's that's the conversation I want to have. Exactly. I, I want to have it. Like if I if I'm a guy that thinks about this capitalistic system is better than full socialism, which I think we're balanced these days, yeah, right? Yeah. Who knows what side? But if I think it's better, let me talk to somebody who's a full blown socialist. Like let's vet those ideas. Yeah. Let's have a conversation. About exactly. It. If I think they're bad, listen to me on why I think they're bad, and then you tell me why they're good. But the debates that we have are really a joke. I mean, take a look at the presidential debates. They're, they're uh, just a, a what? engineered a, a, sound. A what, right? Yeah, it's, it's just engineered sound bites. Yeah, it's terrible. So or do you think you have, and sitting here having conversation with you, um, there's this been th- thing on my mind with going through, not to talk about what people's opinion in COVID and the pandemic. Like We just had these, the most unique two years of my life, of my 43 years, that um, it was just wild. Um, good, bad. I don't. Even, it shouldn't even been a side. It shouldn't have been politics. Right. But it's negatively impacted education. Mm-hmm. And I tie a lack of education, um, how much education, uh, what level of importance it's placed in the home, poverty, how that ties in. I bet you had a lot of experience and engagement and understanding about poverty in our in our city in our sure. area. Yeah. What do you have an opinion? I'm not trying to do you have an opinion on, you know, generational poverty, poverty our education system. I was in a meeting and the reason why I asked this, I was in a meeting of a lot of influential people. Don't know why I got invited. I'm getting invited to some more of these things more and more with the real estate company I run. And I saw stats from all the northern Kentucky um educational stats over the past 2 and 3 years and kids really suffered. Yes, they did. Right? They in a terrible way. Yep. But what you see is the kids in the areas that you think they would suffer the most, they did, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You could pull out two or three of these high-performing school districts. Those kids didn't suffer as much in the pandemic. Sure. Right? So do you have opinions or even more than opinions, do you have expertise and knowledge about poverty, education in the communities? How in the heck do we help and try to fix that problem? Well, you know, I'm a product of public schools. You mentioned that uh-huh. you are. Uh-huh. Um, 
I've you know learned through covering education for many years in the newsrooms that in many cases, and I'm not calling out teachers individually, but their unions are a huge obstacle to solving these problems because they have become so politicized and because their bottom line is always financial. Um, and it, the interests of the children are often really a, a way deep second or third place compared to what, what's on the agenda. And it's really a shame. You know, when you brought up the whole COVID thing, too, it just seems to me this ties right into what we're talking about. People do not trust our institutions. They don't trust the experts anymore. The experts are untrustworthy. In many cases, they were giving us complete lies and nonsense. And that divided us. And the media didn't help because it chose sides and totally tried to um, sort of uh, marginalize and banish any thought or opinions that contradicted the quote-unquote narrative. So uh, what happens is that just alienates people farther. They, they have less trust for not only now the media and the institutions, and then you have these, this a national crisis yeah. where, I mean, one of our great existential crises of facing this pandemic, which could have been much worse, really, um, was caused and made much worse by this distrust and by the divisions that happened around it politically. Yeah. Like, I think, because the issue with me when I started processing this, I remember back to March 14th or 16th of 2020, running a company. And it's like, wow, there's something really unique happening here. And I remember we thought social distance was the answer. They were actually telling us in the beginning, not masks, all this stuff. There's all these things and then masks. But I remember gathering in a circle with the managers and the leadership of my company, and there's six of us. We had never done this before. In a circle, six feet apart, on the 14th or 16th, having a conversation like, hey, what do we do? Yeah. Right? And I remember saying, because at first it was, we sent them home for two or three weeks. And then we sent them home for six weeks. But I didn't get to go home. Somebody had to keep the thing running. Yeah. Someone had to. Uh-huh. And then, I'm in the real estate business, that was deemed essential. So then <laughs> who makes these decisions? It was fascinating. Yeah. And so I personally really quick made a judgment that I don't know who to trust. Yeah. And that's exactly what you're talking about. And I'm really curious and I try to vet out because casinos are essential. Yeah. Churches are not. Isn't it wild? What? I, it's it's so wild to me. <laughs> it's just unbelievable yeah, when it you is. look back on it. And so how can we trust it? But so I was uh, this is something about this education piece. So I was sitting in this meeting and we hear funding so much, mm-hmm. right? We're like, money fixes the problem. Yes. Money, f- that's, that's the biggest myth going. So here's what I saw. I saw for the first time on a screen the exact per spend per student in all of our school districts. It was on the screen. Isn't it shocking? In Newport, Kentucky, one of the most underperforming districts right now in northern Kentucky. Not saying anything bad about superintendents, not bad about teachers. It's the facts. Yes. It's underperforming. By the same test scores as Fort Thomas, as Beechwood, the public schools, Boone County, Campbell County, Kenton County, somewhere in there. But here's the fact. $23,000 are spent each year Wow, for each kid per in, pupil. in the Newport Independent Schools. 3000 of that goes towards administration, which is too much. But 20000 per pupil. It's more than any of the kids in any of those districts. See, there's that's the whole problem. I think you put your finger right on it. It's that we've been trying to solve these problems by throwing money at them, and it's so much bigger than that. Yep. What does it come down to? It comes down to parents being involved. Okay. So the parents who who homeschooled their kids or helped them through, they're going to be okay. Here's, here's the fact. I grabbed the mic in that meeting, full of a lot of influential people, and I could feel it was very unpopular what I said. I looked to, I'm not going to say what positions, but positions in the school systems. I looked to them and said, hey, can you all just answer me one question? There's nonprofit people, all political sides. I said, you ask me one question. First off, I said, I grew up food stamp poor in the public school system. And I got invited to this room today. I'm pretty sure it turned out okay. Mm Mm-hmm. So the question is, did I have more or fewer resources when I grew up in the public school system than they do now? 
And they're like, Mark, they have more now. Absolutely. Okay. So I said, okay. Debatable. One more question. If those kids that go home, and this is very unpopular, I don't care. I just want to talk about the facts. If those kids that go home to the top performing school districts, if the kids in the low performing school districts went home to the same homes, Mm -hmm. that those kids in the top performing school districts, would we be dealing with the problems we deal with? And they wouldn't answer it. Wow. A person who is passionate about whatever, letting people off the hook, whatever, grabbed a mic and responded for the people I was asking the question to. Oh. Right? Yeah. And I just went, okay. Because you're you're disrupting the narrative. That's it. So, you know, I said, I was like, you know what? I don't belong in these rooms. Yeah. There is, there's always a, a line, an agenda. You can call it the narrative if you want. Um, I like narrative because that's what you hear in newsrooms now. A narrative comes from fiction. So, so know, what do we do with this? So, so here's my perspective. Whether it's generational poverty or whatever, I think from they're just going home to families and sometimes not. They're going home to places that they just don't put an emphasis on education. Yes. I don't know if they don't know how. I don't know if they weren't trained to, but that's the facts. And, and the problem is I don't know how we fix that problem. Well, um, that takes me back to a school board meeting we had with one of the superintendents in the Cincinnati public school system who came in and we talked to him about the fact that the, uh, um, they, their graduation rate was uh, below 20% for their high school, which is un- unbelievable to me. Can't comprehend I, it. I couldn't believe it. And we asked the superintendent, honestly, what do you think um, could be done to fix this? And he said, you know, this is going to be uh, radical and unpopular, but I would say we'd have to build dorms and put those kids in a place where they get three meals and they get attention and they have somebody, an, an adult, who will tell them to do their homework and to give, show some support. He said, that's the answer. And we put that in an editorial, and I'm telling you, all hell broke loose. Do you know what? That's the exact same opinion I have. It, it was amazing. You got to. The take- whole system was so set up against any idea that you would do that. It was like, how dare you suggest? It was okay, so give me a better suggestion that's going to fix the problem. More money. That's always the same answer. Yeah. So, so uh, you're not. Teachers aren't paid enough. Well, okay. So here's the thing. So maybe they aren't. Administrators. We don't have enough administrators. Maybe we don't. But that's a separate <laughs> problem. I just know this. The teachers weren't paid any more per capita when I was growing up. A lot less. Fewer administrators. Yep. Right? Yep. I went home to a poor family. Yep. But my parents expected me to do my homework. It all starts there. They expected me that when we took a test, they expected me to do well. Yep. It starts there. It starts in the community you're living in. If you're in a community, even if you have caring parents, you can be in a community where everybody beats you down and uh, holds you up to ridicule if you have answers in class. That you're the, you know, you don't fit. You're yeah. the square peg. I and, and I asked this other, through this conversation. I said, hey, guys, I think we're putting a lot on public education that doesn't belong on your shoulders. Mm-hmm. I think we're trying to blame you through these test scores for things that don't identify if this is happening here or not. E- right? Even if unions aren't the best and all that, it's like, hey, we're holding you accountable for things you don't control. Absolutely, and that's why uh, over the years um, I always supported charter schools and ch- school choice mm-hmm. to let parents take that 23000 and move it to the school of their choice mm-hmm. because that's their money. That's allocated for their child. You know right? what the counter to that is, right? Well, then the public school system will fall apart. And I'm like, so the, here is the issue because I want to say, well, then be better. But here's the question. Do they have no control over that? Well, you mean do they have control over the the, the kids and the test scores and right? So I, I just that's the question. So me, because I'm this, I'm running a business. I'm about accountability. I'm like, okay, then make sure your kids perform better, and the parents don't want to take them to the charter school. But then on the other hand, I'm like, well, we're blaming you for something you don't control. So what do we do? Well, I mean, it, it comes down to that child, doesn't it? Yeah. And what's best for the child, and what's best for that family. And for the parents that are stuck in those systems that are motivated to lift their children up so that they can be successful and rise above that, then I think it's just absolutely, there's no question, you should let them go. You can't hold them trapped in a failing system just because the system's failing. There's your next book. <laughs> I think we're on to something here. Yeah. Um, so or what, maybe your book. Um, I don't think. <laughs> I think if I do, I have ideas and topics I've already documented, um, something around business and sales but it's about mindset 
I think so many things are our outcomes are so much dictated by the way we think. Oh, absolutely. By our attitudes. Yes. Whether or not we continue to educate our brain or not. Mm-hmm. You know, I, that that's what I found. And so I just ask the people around me every day. They're like, "Hey, Mark, like, what's the answer to success?" Yeah. Right. I'm like, just keep going. Keep going. Have a positive attitude. Like Lift that. other people up. It's so simple. Yeah. It is so simple. So, but you have to learn how to do it. Well, you have to like buy into it and believe it's going to be something good. It doesn't always come naturally, <laughs> right? No, it's tough. Um, so, are there any other uh, books on on Peter's Horizon? Well, um, I write about. I start in January usually with a book like this, and um, I work on it for the whole year and bring it out just in time for Christmas, where the sales peak. And then I'll take some time off and market that book and uh, do speaking and book signings and that kind of thing and, and events like this. Mm-hmm. So I probably will get started on another one uh, next a, a year from January, January 24, uh, unless I get the itch to write, because I'll tell you, I love the writing and research so much. It, it is the greatest joy to me to get up, and I get up very early, because if I, especially if I have a book I'm working on, I just can't wait to go to my office and sit down and dive into it. And the research, I describe it as being like a cross between a treasure hunt and being a detective. And the, the clues you find and you trace them down and you find something that's like, wow, that is so cool. I cannot wait to write about that. And now I just have to, you know, put some more around it. And then the writing, I, well, I just, it's my passion. What, what do you think makes a best book? Is there a structure? Is there a format? What oh, makes it best? Yeah, you know, th- that would have so many definitions. There are so many types of books. Um, I read all kinds of books. I usually have like four or five books going at once. So I'm reading uh, historical fiction. I'm reading nonfiction. I'm reading um, novels. I'm reading all kinds of things at once. And uh, I just, I love looking at how other writers work. But I, to me, it comes always comes back to being a storyteller. So if you can tell a story, like you're doing it right here on a, on a podcast, that's you're, you're a storyteller. If you can tell a story, then that's where it all begins. And most people, as you said, they have a story to tell. And I'll tell you what, though. uh, I have um, clients that I meet with. I would say probably half of the people who come to me to write a book finish. Because a lot of people don't realize the discipline that it takes. to. And if you're busy with the rest of your life, um, it, it can be quite a daunting thing. Uh, if you haven't written on deadline or had that experience. But, boy, those who finish are just uh, – there's nothing to substitute for that happy look when you put a book in their hands and say, this is yours. It has to be a tremendous sense of accomplishment. It is. It is. Right. To do something you haven't done before. And I would bo- I would bet that that helps improve that individual. Because anything, anytime I've done something hard for the first time – and writing your first book is hard. It is. Right? And I've, anytime I've done something, it proves to me I can do it. Yeah. And it makes me so much better as a human. You've, you've seen a dream come true. And when that happens, it reinforces the others you have. And then you say, well, what next? What else can I do? Yeah. Um, so if they want to find all your books, it is chilydogpress.com. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, what else? Is that where we go to find the bookstore, to buy the books? Exactly. Where else? Are there any local Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky like Joseph Beth's around. Oh, stuff. all of the local bookstores: uh, Joseph Beth, Bookerly, um, Bookshelf in Madeira. You name it. Any local bookstore, you'll find my books. Both of them. Um, also, Amazon. Um, we have a lot of sales there. You know that. Also, I didn't mention it, but uh, those kind of platforms, especially Amazon, will put millions of eyeballs on your title. And if your title is attractive and the subject is um, contemporary or it has some appeal that fits the culture at the time. You'd be surprised um, how people can have success with their books. And that platform really, I think, more than anything, broke up what I call the publishing cartels, which controlled everything. Because now a writer like Mark uh, can put his book on Amazon and have some really moderate success better than anything he could have done with um, one of the big publishing houses in New York. Uh, So... You know, it, uh, it, so my books, <laughs> to go back to your question, um, all the local bookstores, and, but I try and um, encourage people go, to go to chilidogpress.com to buy them because there I can sign you a copy. That's awesome. I saw that when I went there. Yes, yeah. and also the, the Forbidden Fruit book that yeah. we have here today, that's one of the last press run of color books inside. So the color pictures inside are kind of critical in some of the parts about the Supper Club fire. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, that's um, when that press run is gone, that's, um, that'll be the end of those, and I'm going to go to black and white. You're so cheap, Peter. <laughs> You're trying to make an extra 50 cents on us? What's going on here, man? <laughs> it's just the economics of publishing, I'll tell you. Oh, man. I have to be conscious of that. Yeah. Um, so how many, when you print that next one in black and white, how many, how many will you print? Well, I go with print on demand, so I can print a few hundred, I can print a thousand, I can do whatever I want, and the price stays the same. Or if I go with one of the, the Ohio printers that I like to use, which is Post Printing out of Minster, Ohio, they do a great job and really good people. Uh, there, you're printing, I would usually have a press run of three or 4,000. Okay. Um, what do, uh, how do you start writing a book? What do you do? What do you put down first? The chapters, the ideas, just start writing? Yes. Um, good question. So I start with an outline, which everybody was taught, right? Mm hmm Yep. outline it yep yeah mm -hmm. and as you fill in your outline it'll get bigger and bigger because you start padding and putting things in it's not cast in concrete so your outline may not even resemble the finished project because the chapters will change they lead in different direction those hallways with all the doors you open the door that says oh my gosh there's a whole another book another topic or another right, book yeah. right so um that's how i get started it starts with an idea um, for me, it was uh, in this first book, it was the fact that I'd always heard about the Supper Club fire and I was curious about it. And I'd, I'd done just enough reporting on it to know that there were a lot of questions about whether or not that was an accident or was it intentional. And I said, well, hey, why not research the heck out of it and see what I can find out? And the first thing I found out, which surprised me, was that the first fire was in the 1930s. And it all started then. That's when the mob moved in and they took over the club. Uh, and told him, hey, we'll, we'll buy you out or we'll burn you out, an offer you can't refuse. Well, the, the owner refused, and they burned it out. 1977, but that was in the 30s the first time. The first time in the 30s, a little five-year-old girl was killed. Uh, she was staying there with her sister and the caretaker, and uh, that was the first death on that hilltop in, uh, in Southgate. And then that same club became gradually became the Beverly Hills Supper Club later on in the 1970s when the Schilling family bought it. And then there was another fire. Midway through their remodeling, uh, the place was burned again. And again, it was arson. No question about it. The evidence is all there. And then in 1977, you look at this amazing case where 165 people were killed. The biggest, um, if, it's a, if it is indeed intentional arson, that's the biggest mass murder in the history of our region. And one of the biggest in the in the history of our nation, and uh, so it's a cold case like no other, and the evidence that began to pile up as I interviewed people who were first person witnesses that were working there that night or who knew the family and and worked at the supper club uh, was really compelling, unbelievable stuff. They're building on that site now. Yes. Yeah, I, I, in my own opinion, it's probably time to let it go, and they're doing a memorial for the people who are lost, which is. Really nicer than what was there, which was a tangle of honeysuckle with some homemade signs that were put up by one of the people who survived the fire, uh, who was really a hero that night. And um, so really, I mean, it was kind of a, a spooky place where people would go up and drink and, and maybe sometimes they'd stay overnight and do some weird stuff up there trying to find out if there were spirits and ghosts. And mm -hmm. there's a chapter about that, too. Wow. All in... The Forbidden Fruit. Yes. And that is the first yes. book. Yes. Okay. And then the second one is, again... Not in our town. Okay. Uh, the Queen City versus the King of Smut. Okay. And Who's the King of Smut? Larry Flint. Mm. There were so many surprises when I got into that book because, I mean, the way this worked is in the 70s, if you remember, you're probably too young to remember, but in the 70s, almost every city had what was called a sin strip a tacky neighborhood where there were topless bars and massage parlors and X-rated movies and adult bookstores. All of that crap was all kind of pushed into one bad neighborhood, and it just got worse and worse with all the crime it drew. So, um, But Cincinnati didn't have one. Cincinnati never had a sin strip. So why is that? Well, part of it is that we had our adult playground right across the bridge in Newport, which was one of the biggest in the country. Mm -hmm. Um, so really you look at that and you go, oh, Cincinnati has this ivory clean reputation as a family friendly town where you can raise your kids and, and all this. But what was really the story? Well, the mob was trying to push into Cincinnati during those years and right up through the seventies. And the face of that mob was none other than Larry Flint. 
and he was connected, and he was uh, bankrolled and connected to the Cleveland mob. That's the first time I've ever heard that story. So even guys like me that care about our history, we need to read the book. Uh, well, I, you know, I was in a newsroom for twenty years in Cincinnati, and so many things that came up, I couldn't believe it. I was really surprised. I've never heard that. Yeah, wow. I'd also I'd often heard rumors. Okay. In fact, he was prosecuted in his first case where he went to jail in Cincinnati for obscenity and organized crime. Oh. And uh, and nobody believed it. They all said, "Oh, the Silees, the prosecutor, they're tacking just, it on top." Yeah, and, just yeah, yeah. you know, piling, piling on. on. Yeah. And uh, so I started checking it out, and sure enough, I found the connections. Uh, and he was uh, he was basically had bankrupted eleven bars in Dayton. He was not a successful businessman, as he always pretended. He was a, a failure. And uh, suddenly, he starts opening these hustler clubs in Columbus and Dayton and, and Cincinnati. Well, he had almost a million-dollar loan from the Cleveland mob. Washing the money through it, probably. And in those days, uh, according to the FBI and numerous sources, 95% of all the adult industry was owned and run by the mob. 95%. I mean, that's the industry. That was the whole industry, yeah. yes. Yeah, and they probably didn't know about the other 5% or else they would have pushed them out or taken over the business. Or a lot of those 5% were killed right, or beaten. Um, so what's this, as we wrap this up, what's the, the Silent Mafia in Cleveland? Tell us something about that. Silent Syndicate? Is that Silent Syndicate? Sorry, yeah. 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 Sure. The Silent Syndicate was led, it was called the Cleveland Four, and it was led by a guy named Mo Dallitz. And Mo Dallitz um, was the big crime boss. Now, you go back to the 20s, and they had a, um, a national convention of uh, mafiosos, of organized crime figures. And they all got together because uh, Capone was causing so many headlines with his massacres, the Valentine's Day and the gang wars. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to put a lid on that because it was drawing too much heat. So they got together and they divided the country into basically franchises. And the Cleveland mob got Michigan, Ohio, and Kentucky. So Moe is running the Cleveland mob out of uh, north of, northeastern Ohio, of course. And he came up through the Purple Gang in Detroit, which was among the most vicious and ruthless criminal organizations in the country. So uh, Pete Schmidt opens this club in uh, Newport, and Mo came down to see it, and it was so beautiful. We've got a picture of it as it looked in the 1930s, and it's spectacular. And it was so beautiful, he said, I've got to have this place. And that's when the Cleveland mob moved into Newport in northern Kentucky and really took over. And then they set up their empire. And as they went on, they had even people like Frank Costello from the New York crime families. He had a piece of the action. Uh, the Levinson brothers from Chicago had a piece of the action. And you have all these colorful characters like uh, Red Masterson, the hitman who admitted killing more than 100 people. Uh, he worked for the Cleveland mob. You had uh, Charles Lester, the spider in the middle of the web. He was the mouthpiece, the, the mob attorney who engineered everything in northern Kentucky. You had uh, Big Porky and Little Porky. <laughs> you had all well, there's some good names. However, those happened, right? It's like, come on, guys, you don't want those. Yeah, they That's were just awesome, amazing people. So, for anybody who really had some interest or curiosity around Newport, the mob, and where it spiders out across the country, this book gives it to you. Yes, and then if you want to find out of what happened in Ohio. It spidered into Ohio. There's chapters in there about all of the cities in Ohio and how they were under these various area codes of mob control. Mm -hmm. So Toledo had its own control. Akron, Youngstown, another mob. Cleveland, uh, Columbus had a different mob. Uh, Cincinnati was under control of the Cleveland Syndicate through Newport. Wow. And uh, it, it, there was some amazing corruption. And uh, it, it's just a fascinating story of what's going on. I hope it doesn't make me more pessimistic. I'm trying to be optimistic these days. <laughs> um, but I need a new book. I just put one down, so maybe this will be some of the holiday book. I'm doing Holiday in Spain oh, great, so for a few great. days. So. All right. Um, that should be great. So, hey, thanks for coming in. Oh, my pleasure. This was this really was awesome. Fun to be with you. Yeah, great conversation. Oh, you make it easy. It's Like you said, it's a conversation. I think I'm getting a little better every day. Uh -huh. um, so thanks, and I look forward to what uh, these guys are going to do, and they'll make us sound great actually it's harder to make me look great we talked about that <laughs> we i think a, you look pretty good here we go thank you very much all right so thanks and for coming too. in and go right yeah well we already know that thanks for propping me up my ego needed it um but um so holiday season you're buying some gifts check out your website absolutely uh, we've got a special on there for christmas gifts awesome. uh, buy two and get free shipping um and uh, i can sign them for people so that makes it personal when's the last day 
that they could order some of these books and have a signed copy for someone. Do you know what that is? Well, usually um, local mail gets is pretty amazingly fast, about two days. Okay. So two or three days. I, would, I wouldn't I would wait till more than three or four days before Christmas. The third week sure. of December, though. Yeah. They're still it, okay then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm excited. So I have this one. Guys, I didn't have to pay for this. He brought it. He's not taking it back. <laughs> Uh oh, he gave me the laugh like I'm going to pay for it. Um, no, you can buy the second one. Oh, okay, that's what it is, right? This is the deal. Um, so go on his website. Thanks a lot. I'm interested. Maybe we'll find something to talk about again. Absolutely. All right. Enjoyed thank you. it. Okay.